but certainly in these meetings, um, played a really critical role in every respect, not just And with that, which was not on the agenda, there is an agenda. If there's any changes for the agenda, uh, let me know. Otherwise, we'll assume uh, they're correct. And we can move on to the approval of the minutes from our meeting on August 24th. We have a motion and a second for approval of the minutes. Move approval. Thank you. Second. Thank you. Any discussion? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? The motion of the minutes are adopted. At this point, we uh, have offered an invitation for members of the public to address the council on matters that are not on the agenda. And we didn't have any people register ahead of time? No, we don't. No? Okay, we don't anticipate anybody, so uh, we can move on to the consent agenda. Uh, may I have a motion and a second for the consent agenda? Move approval. Second. Thank you, thank you. Uh, <coughs> any discussion? All right, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carried. On to the reports of the standing committees and uh, we are going to hear first from community development. Councilmember Lilligren. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair and council members. And community development committee brings two items uh, forward for consideration today. It's always a good day when we're making grant awards and giving away money to our communities in the metro area. So today's actions are both funding recommendations for the 2022 Livable Communities Act uh, grants. The first is item number 2022-242. It's to award $542,900 in Livable Communities Act pre-development grant uh, funds to support four pre-development projects in three different cities. Pre-development grants are intended for projects that need to complete additional work to fully shape and detail the final development. And they typically include a range of activities, including, but not limited to, feasibility analysis, various project studies, infrastructure system engineering, development and planning needs, design work, and community engagement. Uh, five applications were received from the cities of Brooklyn Center, Minneapolis, St. Paul, and Little Canada. Four applications that were submitted met the minimum scoring criteria and award limits to be eligible for funding. The projects awarded will support affordable housing, mixed use development, and local small business and community organizations. Uh, remaining funds can be uh, allocated through future programming. So Mr. Chair, I move that the Metropolitan Council award four Livable Communities Act pre-development grants totaling $542,900 as shown in table one of the business item. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Any discussion? All right, hearing none, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carried. <coughs> yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. The next business item is 2022-243. It's to award $94,000 in Livable Communities Act policy development grants to support two policy development projects in two cities. Uh, so policy development grants support cities in developing and adopting policies that support Livable Communities Act goals of increased housing choice through more affordable housing options, living wage job creation, uh, compact con connected development, and environmental sustainability, all with the underlying principle of equitable, equitable development. Two applications were received from the cities of Matamidi and Minnetonka. The policies they develop will help support environmental sustainability measures throughout each city. The remaining funds can be allocated to future in future programming. So, Mr. Chair, I move that the Metropolitan Council award two Livable Communities Act policy development grants totaling $94,000 as shown in Table 1 of the business item. Thank you. Is there a second? 
Thank you. Uh, any discussion? All right, hearing none. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed? Thank you. And you're right, it's always a good day to be giving grants. Mm -hmm. Next up is the Environment Committee, and I believe that's handled by Councilmember Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, business item 2022-248 is the same week item requesting uh, that the council authorize the original administrator to award and execute a contract to provide sandblasting, metal repairs, corrosion resistant coating application to the internal metal parts, concrete structures, and the exterior tap catwalk system for the primary tank at Seneca plant. Now, normally this would have been at our environment committee meeting yesterday, but due to a last minute illness, we didn't have a quorum to have the meeting. It was on our consent agenda, but legal has said it's okay for us to come directly here for this. It's, it's a very routine maintenance item. Um, it, it is time sensitive because of temperature concerns with the materials. So if we were to wait, it would have to be pushed until next year. And it's always good to do the maintenance sooner rather than later. So thank you for letting us have this item without meeting with the Environment Committee. The Seneca plant is vulnerable to process disruption if its tanks are not kept in proper working condition. There's only two primary tanks in the facility and you always have to have at least one working. So you take one out of service and repair it and then take the other one out of service and repair it. The process that takes place in the primary tank is corrosive to the concrete and the metal internal components. So Periodically, you do have to remove them from service to clean them, repair them, and su sustain functionality and meet level of service required for reliable operation, safety, and environmental protection. This contract will provide the necessary refurbishment, repairs, and coatings to the degraded concrete and metal structures within the primary tank. Therefore, Mr. Chair and members of the Council, I move that the Metropolitan Council authorize the Regional Administrator to award and execute contract 21P091 with Champion Coatings Incorporated to provide sandblasting metal repairs, apply cor corrosion resistance coating to the internal metal parts, concrete structures, and the exterior ca catwalk system for the primary tank at Seneca plant in an amount not to exceed $740,416. Thank you, council member. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, and I will just uh, uh, confirm that uh, I approved uh, getting this on the agenda today, um, same week, but it is uh, important to expedite this important routine work. John Tierney is here in the, uh, if we have any questions uh, or discussion, um, any questions or discussion? Uh, Go ahead, Raymond. Thank Council you. Members, Aaron. Thank you. Thank you, Chair. Uh, I just wanted to reiterate something that uh, having the proper coatings on uh, in the, in the plan is it, that's paramount to keeping it running and uh, and having it in good shape, good working order. And uh, you know we couldn't get this done in the uh, environmental committee, but uh, I'm glad we get a chance to just. Uh, talk about it here, and uh, this is something that I would definitely uh, would have championed. Oh, that's kind of a pun. Uh, <laughs> anyway, uh, thank you for giving me a moment to confirm. Absolutely, thank you for that comment. Anyone else? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Great, that motion carried. Well, there's no uh, reports from the management committee, but there are for the Transportation Committee, Council Member Barber. Thank you, Mr. Chair, Council Members. Business item number 2022-237 is the same week item for the Gold Line Contaminated Materials Monitoring Contract. This contract will cover contaminated materials monitoring and reporting through the construction phase of the Gold Line project. In the design phase, several issue areas were identified and a response action plan was developed and approved by the Minnesota Pollution Control Agency. A critical aspect of the project is that the uh, response action plan is properly implemented on a day 
day-to-day basis, uh, day-to-day basis. Identified uh, contaminated material along the corridor includes asbestos, arsenic, former streetcar ties, uh, lead from former um, from a former dump area, buried debris, petroleum, and building removal from a former fuel station. Um, the work is anticipated to begin in October. The contract will be <coughs> responsible for handling and monitoring of all the contaminated materials that are cont- encountered during construction, implementing the response action plan, and reporting how to or reporting to describe how contaminated materials are managed during construction activities, and then also assisting with the regu- as the regulatory agency liaison work with the MPCA. Therefore, Mr. Chair, I move that the Council authorize the Regional Administrator to negotiate and execute contract 22P005 with KLJ Engineering LLC for construction contaminated material services for the Metro Gold Line Bus Rapid Chan- Transit Project in an amount not to exceed $1,313,226.43 contingent upon approval by the Gold Line BRT Executive Change Control Board. Thank you. Is there a second? Second. Thank you. Um, any discussion? All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed, that motion carried. On to joint reports, and we have a joint report of environment and community development committees. It's so nice to see these plans coming in. Councilmember Lilligren. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair and council members. So both of these items are comprehensive plans uh, for communities that are connected to the regional wastewater system. So they were heard in both communities, as the chair said. Uh, For both communities, council staff found that the 2040 plans conform to regional systems plans, are consistent with council policies, and are compatible with the plans of adjacent affected jurisdictions. Uh, The first of these is business item 2022-229. It is to authorize the city of Bayport's 2040 comprehensive plan and approve their comprehensive sewer plan. Mr. Chair, I move that the Metropolitan Council adopt the attached advisory comments and review record and take the following actions. The recommendations from the Community Development Committee authorize the city of Bayport to place its 2040 comprehensive plan into effect to revise the city's forecast downward as shown in table one of the attached review record, to revise the city's affordable housing need allocation for 2021 to 2030 to seven units, and to advise the city to implement the advisory comments in the review record for forecasts. And the recommendation from the Environment Committee approve the city of Bayport's comprehensive sewer plan and the sewer forecasts in the comprehensive sewer plan need to be revised for consistency with the revised citywide forecasts in the land use section of the plan and as outlined in the wastewater section of this plan of this review record the corrected forecasts must be included in the comprehensive sewer plan as part of the final submittal to the council thank you is there a second second thank you any discussion All right, all those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carried. Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. The next business item is 2022-230. It's to authorize Willerney this 2020 comprehensive plan and approve their comprehensive sewer plan. Mr. Chair, I move that the Metropolitan Council adopt the attached advisory comments and review record and take the following actions. The recommendation from the Community Development Committee is to authorize the City of Willerney to place its 2040 comprehensive plan into effect and to advise the city that when available, uh, council staff requests that the city provide the council the date the city adopts the final local water management plan. Council staff also requests that the city provide the council with the copy of the final adopted local water management plan that will be included in the final plan document that the city adopts if it differs from the draft local water management plan previously submitted to the council and also to implement the advisory comments and the review record for transportation and land use and from the environment committee to approve the city of Willerney's comprehensive sewer plan and advise the city to implement the advisory comments in the review record for wastewater services thank you is there a second second thank you uh, any discussion Questions? Not. All those in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? That motion carried. Thank you Thank all you. Uh, for those business items. Um, we now have two information items, and the first up 
We're uh, going to hear from Jerry Sutton and Sheila Holbrook White. Welcome, Jerry and Sheila. This is on the um, MTS waiver transportation program. Welcome. Good afternoon, Chair Zelli and Council members. I'm Sheila Holbrook White. I'm the uh, waiver program manager in the Metropolitan Transit Services Division, or MTS. I am honored to be presenting today with the Director of Contracted Services, Jerry Sutton. This afternoon, we will be providing you with an overview of the waiver transportation program, how we arrived at this point, where we are headed, the fiscal implications of the program, and the positive impacts on the lives of low-income persons with disabilities and older adults that we're seeking to deliver. I'd like to begin our presentation by first refreshing your memory of the Metro Mobility Service Area. As shown in this map, the light blue shaded area with a uh, dash border represents the federally mandated, federally required ADA service area. For customers who have been certified for Metro Mobility, when they request a trip that begins and ends in that federally required ADA service area, they must be provide, that trip must be provided during the same days and hours of fixed route service. Being placed on standby is not permitted for individuals with trips beginning and ending in that area. If a Metro Mobility customer whose trips begin and end in the blue area make regular trips to the same location on the same day at the same hour, at least once a week, he or she can request a standing order. Assuming these trips are expected to be consistent for six months or more, an approved standing order relieves that individual, their caregivers or their allies, from making advanced reservations for this regularly scheduled trips. Essentially, the trip is just scheduled. It's automatic. The gray area in that uh, map is the non-ADA service area. A certified Metro Mobility customer whose trip begins and ends in the gray area will be placed on standby. In other words, the customer or a caregiver may request a trip during days and hours of service, but will not have a confirmed ride when they complete that request. They will not receive that confirmation until the day before their trip. The inability to provide that confirmed ride results from the federal mandate that Metro Mobility prioritize trips that begin and end in the blue service area first. Because of their standby status, these non-ADA trips are not eligible for standing orders. So that individual, his or her family or allies, will be required to make reservations with Metro Mobility up to four days in advance for each and every trip, even those that are requested for the same day and time on a routine basis. Critically, there is no guarantee that individuals, even those with those routine trips that start and or end in that gray area will always reach their destination. Again, the federal requirement to prioritize trips that begin and end in the ADA service area often constrains capacity such that a requested trip in the non-ADA service cannot be provided. The, non, the ADA and non-ADA service areas we just reviewed are critical in understanding the proposed changes. However, I do want to be very clear. The changes we're going to discuss are going to impact only a subset of Metro Mobility customers. The customers impacted are waiver service recipients. These are individuals with disabilities, some ages 55 and older, with very limited income that qualify for home and community-based services through the Minnesota Department of Human Services, or DHS. Waivers allow participants to access community-based supports and services and allows them to live in the communities that they call home, rather than opting for institutional care in a hospital or a nursing care facility. In Minnesota, DHS designates counties and tribes as lead agencies to determine who is waiver eligible, 
to identify the supports and services they will receive and to authorize the payment agreements for the delivery of that service. The financial resources for these programs come from DHS and use both state and federal sources. Many waiver participants attend day support programs. State licensed providers offer an array of services, including preparation for competitive employment, life skills training, and socialization to individuals with disabilities enrolled in these programs. Adults ages 55 and older may opt to participate in adult day support programs, which are similarly provided in facilities with a focus on socialization and activities that support that individual's interests. These services are generally available Monday through Friday for about six hours each day for each participant. Metro Mobility currently offers two sets of services for day support programs participants. Through the agency contract, participants who attend the region's 10 largest day support and adult day programs whose trips begin and end in the blue area, that ADA service area you just saw on that previous map, receive standing orders to and from these facilities. Also stable, agency, contractor, agency contract drivers remain the same. So it provides fertile ground for relationships to build between a passenger, a driver, other individuals on that same trip, their families and their allies. These features off, offer a premium level of service at the same fare as that which is paid by other Metro Mobility customers. The second set of services for individuals participating in day support programs is through the demand contract. For participants attending one of the region's other 61 day support programs that are not among that largest group, Metro Mobility will connect the individual to his or her facility. <coughs> if the participant's trip starts and ends in the ADA service area, the blue area of our map, and the individual travels to and from the same facility on the same day and time, standing orders are an option. However, the driver assignment is dynamic. So multiple drivers may be transporting an individual during the course of a week to his or her day program. And for day support program participants whose trips start or end in the non-ADA service area, the gray area of our previous map, there is no standing order. There is, of course, a standby and potentially a trip that cannot be provided. While I've described current services, I'm going to turn it to Jerry to introduce and discuss the waiver transportation program history, where we've been, and where we are heading. So this program has had many stops and starts along the way, but recent changes made by DHS have made the Council's transition to waiver services not only possible, but advantageous to the state to the council, to day support programs, and most importantly, to individuals with disabilities. Conversations with DHS started in 2015, but there were barriers around <coughs> conflicting regulatory requirements that we couldn't resolve. In 2018, we were able to pass statutory language that allowed us to share data with DHS. Before diving into this project, we wanted to better understand the magnitude of how many Metro Mobility trips were being taken by clients eligible for waiver services transportation funding. Matching the data was difficult, and we were only able to draw general conclusions, but the exercise gave us enough confidence to move forward with this project. The real turning point came in 2021 when DHS transitioned to unbundled rates for day service programs. With this change, transportation costs and program costs were split into two separate components of financial support for participants. As a result of this change and challenges with employee shortages, we are seeing a significant number of day service providers in the metro area abandon their own transportation programs and rely more heavily on Metro Mobility to transport their clients. Many day service programs have not returned to their pre-COVID levels, but we expect that before long, previous participants will re-enter day programs or competitive employment in the community, and that will put additional pressure on the Metro Mobility program. Recognizing this new landscape, 
and what it likely means to future pressure on Metro Mobility, we enrolled as a home and community-based service provider in 2021 through DHS. We also hired Sheila to manage program development and worked with staff from Dakota and Washington counties on a small pilot program. Early this year, we abandoned the pilot because there were unresolved concerns by county staff with our proposed approach. County involvement and buy-in is critical to this effort because they serve as the agents for DHS and approve all waiver services. Because of that, we took a huge step back and completely restructured our approach. Over the past several months, we have developed a much better service delivery model. This trade-off from our original approach is that it is no longer a small-scale pilot. The project now involves discontinuing our current agency contract in 2024 and replacing it with waiver service contract that will be distinctly different than much mobility. It requires careful planning and a longer lead time so that we can properly inform and transition customers, day service providers, and county social service staff that are developing budgets on behalf of program participants. This slide explains how waiver transportation services fit into the new structure. As I just mentioned, Metro Mobility and waiver services will be two distinctly different programs, but both fall under the umbrella of the Council's Special Transportation Services statutory language. We have discussed our proposal with the Council's legal staff to ensure that there are no issues around regulatory and statutory compliance. Both programs meet the objectives found in State Statute 473.386, which has historically been considered the Metro Mobility language. But this language allows for a broader scope of services than the Metro Mobility program as we know it today. The stated objective of the Council's Special Transportation Services is to provide greater access to transportation for the elderly and persons with disabilities. <clears throat> Beyond state statute, Metro Mobility must comply with the requirements established by the FTA for ADA complementary service, while the waiver service program will meet the requirements established by Minnesota's Department of Human Services. The second objective found in statute is to develop an integrated system of special transportation services, and we think the change we are proposing advances this objective with benefits for both participants and the region overall. Also within this section of state statute are several duties, but I will highlight just two of them. First, we will need to consult with the Transportation Accessibility Advisory Committee on this change and propose that we would do that within the next couple of months. Second, the waiver service will need to also be provided within the state's defined service area, and that's the gray area that you saw on that map earlier. Finally, because the waiver service program falls under the umbrella of special transportation services, it will be eligible for state forecasted funding starting with the July 1st, 2025 fiscal year. So building on Jerry's overview, while both programs are eligible for forecasted funding, the waiver transportation service offers distinct premium features that are not available through Metro Mobility. These premium features include, as this map illustrates, no more blue, no more gray. While Metro Mobility availability is tied to fixed route service, waiver services are not. So the service distinctions between the ADA and the non-ADA in Metro Mobility map we showed you earlier, <coughs> they no longer apply. Yes to standing orders, regardless of where the trip begins and ends and the waiver transportation service area, so long as the trip meets those other requirements repeated on certain days, times, and locations. No to standbys. As a service that is distinct from Metro Mobility, no to Metro Mobility applications, certifications, and recertifications. Yes to greater opportunity with extended days and hours of service. Our current proposal seeks to offer waiver services from 6 a.m. to 10 p.m. each weekday and on weekends between 8 and 10 p.m. These extended hours are intended to serve both those who attend day support programs 
and or those who are competitively employed. For persons with disabilities who often start their careers in retail, light warehousing, and hospitality sectors, being able to work weekends and evenings is essential to getting hired, to staying employed, and being promoted. Yes to greater consistency and stability. Unlike Metro Mobility, the days and hours of service offered through the waiver program are not tied to the fixed route. That might be available in any specific community. Because of that, any changes, including contractions in fixed route services, days and hours of service no longer apply. And no to onboard payment and or fare cards. Critically, DHS also recognizes that the waiver transportation program offers recipients a premium service, which will allow MTS to charge more than the adopted Metro Mobility rate and fare and to bill these services once they are delivered directly to DHS. At its most fundamental, the waiver transportation program seeks to connect people with disabilities to the lives they want and desire in the communities through the, its reflection of community-driven priorities, state plans, regional plans, and legislatively mandated recommendations. Focused on connecting waiver participants to the services, supports, and resources needed to remain independent in their communities, the waiver program advances multiple objectives and priorities, including the goals that were articulated in the state's Olmstead plan, the regional priorities identified in the 2020 Twin Cities Public Transit and Human Services Transportation Coordination Plan, and recommendations found in the 2018 legislatively mandated Metro Mobility Task Force Report. The waiver program offers substantive positive impacts to customers. For waiver participants whose trips start and or end in what is currently the Metro Mobility non-ADA service area, they can request standing orders to day support programs and to competitive jobs across the service area. MTS will honor as many requests as possible, recognizing existing constraints and no standbys. For waiver participants whose trips begin and end in the current Metro Mobility ADA area, Individuals who attended one of the other day support programs not included in the agency contract had some access to standing orders. Waiver participants will have improved opportunity to arrange those <coughs> orders for day support programs across the service area. And for those with trips that begin and end in the ADA service area, changes to fixed route service no longer impact their access to day support and or to competitive employment. Consistent across all waiver service, service participants are the following improvements. Expanded days and hours of available service, which improves access to competitive employment. Consistent driver assignments. No onboard payments. A single point of contact for service management. No certifications or recertifications. So Sheila's talked a lot about the benefits we believe this new program brings to persons that participate in waiver covered services. But this project really started with a focus on creating a financial benefit for the state by drawing down more federal funds in lieu of state general funds. This slide illustrates how funding sources will shift under the waiver program. Currently, if we assume a cost of $28 per passenger, the council's general fund money is covering $20 of the cost. DHS is buying, on average, a $4 fare. Two of that is paid by state sources, and two is paid by federal sources. In addition, the council receives $4 in 5307 formula funds to support that ride. With this change, if we assume that the market rate for the trip is $20, and that's the amount that the county would be willing to pay us per ride, the council will bill DHS for $20. 10 instead of two would come from federal sources, and $10 from DHS forecasted state budget. The net increase to the state in federal sources is $8 per ride. If we assume 2019 ridership levels and a market rate of $20 per ride, we estimate that there will be a shift of over $7 million from the Metro Mobility General Fund to DHS, and about 50% of that 
will come from federal sources instead of state funding. Just a few highlights of our proposed schedule as we wrap. We plan to complete the RFP in quarter three of this year. We will be launching outreach and engagement to disability serving agencies, including our current agency day support programs and those served via the demand contract. With 71 licensed and operating day support programs across the region, I'm very excited that we'll be able to include additional agencies, both large and small, across the, across, and through this effort. In quarter four, we will fulfill our statutory duties of consulting with the TAC, with plans to release the RFP in quarters one or two of 2023, we will have the support, we will have the option to extend the current agency contract into quarter two, 2024, as needed to ensure a seamless launch of this program. With timing to be determined, we will collaborate with lead agencies to prepare administratively for the transition of waiver service recipients to the waiver program. We prioritized this transition by starting with our current agency passengers, approximately 92% of which are waiver participants. Then we'll follow that with our current demand passengers with waivers who have not had access to the premium features of this program, and then to passengers who may be traveling to a day support program that has not been actively cultivated. Related as these transitions take place, we'll be reaching out to adult day programs services that offer life skills and socialization services to individuals over age 55. Many, again, are waiver participants. So as we sunset the agency program, we'll also transition those current agency passengers who opt not to participate in the waiver program to demand response services. We have covered a lot of information in this discussion, and we stand for your questions. Thank you so much. Um, Let's open it up to any questions. Deb. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, first of all, I just have to say thank you for all of this. Um, this is, as you can understand, reading, listening to all of this, it's very complicated. Um, and um, I was uh, served on the Metro Mobility Task Force. I was one of the co-chairs. And this was one of the big um, issues that we were looking at. Um, we, were, we knew that there were other federal funds out there, but we could not do access them. And so even just working with their legislative partners, get some legal laws changed and some new authority so we could have DHS talk to Metro Mobility and back and forth was a huge step. And when you look at all of this, when I was just looking at some of the things from the Metro Mobility Task Force report, it was really to maximize all of our funding sources. It was to provide better customer um, experience and support and more flexibility. What you've built here does all of that. I mean, this really, I mean, I think this is you know, it digs down into the details of things, but it really, when you rise up above it, it's a huge impact to our customers, and I think it's a great thing. Um, and now I'm going to actually channel one of my fellow um, uh, council members, because we have a work group that you guys did present this to um, earlier. So I'm channeling Council Member Lindstrom with his question. So um, can you summarize what this would mean to me if I was a Metro Mobility customer from Circle Pines, eligible for waiver transportation services, and I attend either a small day service program or I wish to work for a local retailer as part of my DHS-supported services? So living in Circle Pines, is going to mean that all the trips you take from your residence are in that non-ADA, that gray part of the map we showed you earlier. So any ride you book from that point would not be available for a standing order. So you'll need to call Metro Mobility up to four days in advance before the day that you need, for example, to go to your day support program or to work to schedule your ride. And then we're going to place you on standby until the day before. Most of the time you're going to get that ride um, but there are times you may be denied because we simply don't have enough drivers. Unfortunately, we can't confirm that trip until the day before. Also, something to bear in mind, while Metro Mobility serves Circle Pines on weekdays and weekends, working retail is going to be challenging because um, if you anticipate you're going to be scheduled to work through evening mm -hmm. hours or until closing on a weekend. So you may want to talk to your employer about the limits on your schedule, that you may have short notice absences from work or investigating some additional options if your ride is denied because of your capacity on your work hours, particularly if they fall after Metro Mobility service hours. 
If you are eligible and choose to participate in the waiver program, you will be eligible for standing orders. So as your schedule becomes more predictable and assuming overall capacity because of driver shortages, this means you're not gonna be making phone calls to request trips every time you need to go to work and we're not gonna put you on standby. Instead, pre-scheduled rides, often with the same driver who knows you and knows where you're going. You'll be able to work longer hours on those weeknights and on weekends and you'll no longer need to pay the peak or non-peak fare. You no longer have to worry about having cash for a go-to card. We hope you'll consider being a waiver participant <laughs> with us. Yeah, um, if I may, Chair, thank you very much, because sure. I think it really helps to show what the experience is for a person and um, why this is such a, an important program. So thank you. Councilmember Lilligren, we had a question. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. And uh, I really want to uh, commend you both, uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Uh, Holbrook-White, on this work. And I had the opportunity to see it in the Transportation Work Group as well. And, and I just think you and your team have done amazing things here in an environment of conflicting regulations, statutes, laws, funding. And, and I'm very impressed, and, and I appreciate it. And, uh, and I did have a question, uh, Ms. Holbrook, what you said a couple of times when you were introducing this, you used the term uh, competitive employment. And so I'm just wondering if under this, these programs, if that has a spe specific designation, a specific threshold for access for these services. Mr. Chair and um, Council Member, the, under the waiver program, there are specific subsets of TRIPS that a waiver can be used to pay for the cost of that trip. Competitive employment is one of those, and that is employment where a person is working in the community, perhaps in retail or hospitality, or they're working in some other environment, where the idea behind that is that the folks with whom you work are not all people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. They are people, so you have an opportunity to build natural supports, because you're meeting new people and getting to work with new individuals. This reflects a significant change in the way that individuals with disabilities were expected to work because it says you are good enough to compete in the economy mm. and we want to support and help you get that job and be that taxpayer you've always wanted to be perhaps and also to be able to be promoted and retain that work. Thank you and Mr. Chair, Ms. Ms. Holbrook White, that so, uh, so the evaluation of that employment opportunity for that individual is part of a metric that's that's evaluated when they apply for the program? Yep. Okay. So that'll be something that we work through with the counties okay. as they give us service authorizations. I do want to be very clear about the, um, the fact that the competitive employment element is a substantial shift. Sure. Um, what we have often heard from people with disabilities, including those that ride Metro Mobility, is it's hard to find a job when you can't guarantee you can get there, mm. when you have hours of service that you're not sure you're gonna be able to connect. And this is a way to make you a more attractive candidate to an employer that you're seeking to work with. And so part of that um, element of who's gonna, that employment is competitive is something a county through their service authorization confirms and allows us right. to serve. Very cool. Thank you. Thank you, uh -huh. Mr. Chair. Yeah, thank you. Really good. Uh, any others? Uh, Councilmember Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I agree with everything that's already been said. This has been a huge change in how we do things, and it took a lot of work over many, many years. And thank you, thank you, thank you for getting us there. I'm just grateful for how much stress this is going to take off mm -hmm. of our disabled customers yeah. mm -hmm. because I hear so often from people who live outside of the ADA area or have to go to school or something outside of the ADA area that are just in constant chaos and worry about whether they're going to have a ride. And that's a horrible way mm -hmm. to live. It, it makes for other members of the family to not be able to work or do things because they have to keep telling their work, oh, I have to give my kid a ride to this program because Metro Mobility didn't show up today. And having the same driver every time as much as possible will take off a lot of stress as well because I've heard from people 
who live in buildings with multiple doors and when their driver doesn't know them, they go to a different door and they end up missing their ride because the driver goes to the door, they're not at that door, they're at the door they always wait at, but the driver went to a different one and they end up being accused of being a no-show for their trip, which is also really, really stressful for people. So this is really huge. People don't understand how stressful Metro Mobility can be and this is going to go a long way towards making things better for people. So thank you for doing that. Thanks for sharing that perspective. It is about how we serve our customers. Uh, Councilmember Gonzalez, you had a question. Yeah, and not to belabor the point, but that has been made here before about the huge impact that this is going to have on folks. But I can say that on. Uh, if you look at the map, uh, my district, which is mostly Washington County, is not on the DADA, and that includes most of the population for some reason. So that's one of the main, this is one of the main areas of complaints that I receive from constituents is the lack of uh, consistent and, and, and tight <coughs> uh, metro mobility services. And actually just this week on Monday, I got a, an email from a constituent that uh, she shared her story that she became disabled later in life after she was working uh, full time with this company and the lack of um, consistent and uh, services because she lives in an ADA area was putting pressure on her ability to continue working at this place. This is going to have a direct impact on that person. So that's, that's very good and, and actually rewarding to see how your programs are actually changing real people's lives, especially this particular constituent. This is going to serve her, and we know that for sure, and as well as many other people. So thank you very much for all of this work. Anyone else? Oh, go ahead. Uh, Councilmember yeah, Pacheco, and then uh, uh, Johnson. <laughs> uh, you know, Justin, I don't want to repeat myself, but just kind of watch, I guess sometimes it's my, my role or my job. But I didn't see a reference to equity in regards to uh, communities of color and how we're reaching them or, la or different languages. Um, so this is a major change and it all looks wonderful to me and I'm just first looking at it now. Uh, but I, I can see how this would be uh, really beneficial to, these, to the communities and particularly the Spanish speaking community, which I represent as well. Um, to get this information out and to understand this, this change and what it would mean. And, and uh, so I don't know if what, what you're doing in that area. I think it's a combination of items. One, the dis our outreach to the disability serving agencies will start this year, mm -hmm. which may seem like a long way out. That's a long timeline, but it's going to take that repeated contact and connection with people, making sure that they're hearing it from trusted community partners and ambassadors that family members who live together all understand what this may mean for them. I also think um, that it's important to also point out that that's also why we're looking at this longer term uh, transition period with the lead agencies in the counties to make sure that the person who is eligible for that trip, administratively, those mechanisms are not lagging behind and this individual is not getting the trips they need simply because some paperwork has not been completed. So we're looking at multiple opportunities. I also think working with the day support programs directly who often have long-term relationships with the individuals who participate um, will also assist us in making sure those messages are being carried, that they're clear, that they're concise, and they're available in the language of the person best is for which there's best communication. We look forward to working with you on making sure that that um, message is also implemented in multiple communities. Great. Thank you. Councilmember Johnson. That answered my question as well. And I do appreciate the long, I serve on the transportation policy um, work group too. And this is very exciting. And, and that long lead time um, is so key that it's done right. So um, I just want to applaud you both. And also there's a savings for the Met Council built into this, which is really great when you're trying to, I mean, Deb, I don't know, co-chairing this group way back. I mean, these must be the days where you're like, oh my God, you know, we're there, right? So it is nice to see. <laughs> yes, right? The, the, the fruits of your labor. So appreciate everybody's hard work on this and, and to see the expanded service areas where people will now have opportunities to do the things that they want to do with their lives. So thank you. 
Anyone else? Well, I'll just echo our appreciation. Um, I know that winding our way through the process to make this happen it didn't just happen. It took a lot of work. So hats off to you and, and to the council members who were committed to reaching this goal. Thank so you. Uh, we'll stay tuned and see how it works. Uh, and we're going to have one more item. Uh, Meredith is going to discuss the years in setting up a pilot program of microtransit, which was launched this last weekend. I want to thank those council members that were there, Council Member Lilligrand, Council Member Cummings, and uh, tell, us, uh, tell us all what we've got what in I store. Get. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, council members. Um, I'm so happy to be here today to share the update on our launch. Thanks to many of you who attended on Saturday. We greatly appreciated it. It was so nice to see the support from, from that council members. Um, I just have a couple slides and I'll go over kind of a summary for those of you less familiar with the project. Um, Microtransit, so Metro Transit Micro launched last Saturday. It is the first on-demand pilot we are doing as Metro Transit and MTS. It's actually a joint project. Um, so I'll discuss kind of how thing, um, efforts got separated there. So who does operations and who's doing marketing, pieces like that. But this is our service area. It's about two and a half square miles, so relatively small pilot. For microtransit, it is on-demand service, so it is app-based. Um, we contracted with a company, and you request the rides by downloading the app, and as long as you're in the service area, you can get picked up at your destination and dropped off, or picked up at your origin and dropped off at your destination, wherever that might be. Um, so this two and a half square service mile, um, you know, I think the most important things for us as we went to launch were expansion of mobility choices, we knew that this was a very high ridership area um, and could really benefit from an additional layer of investment, which is one of the reasons we chose it as a pilot area. We do have an expansion um, area, I would say, built into the app if there is interest and if there is capacity on the system. So about three months in, we are going to do a pretty comprehensive survey with the internal team at Metro Transit of users and see how they're liking the service. Is it working for them? Would they like to see more destinations here? Uh, I should premise this by saying we don't have additional vehicles. However, we do have some additional capacity. So if travel times are really good and we're looking like we can expand, we can look at that option a little bit later. A little on the service design and operations. The image that you see on the right there, that top left corner, that is the icon that you'll see if you were to go into the Google Play or Apple Store right now to download the app. Um, and then you can kind of see the, the screen pop up on that image on the right. So this is point-to-point -point service design. Um, some micro transit, you do have to walk to meet the vehicle. That is not the case here. So we will be picking people up exactly where they are. Uh, the service areas do closely match fixed route transit service in there, so that was by design. Um, we are operating from 5 a.m. to 12 a.m. The fares are going to be the same as bus fare with normal transfer rules applying. So if you're TAP eligible or you're a student, um, all of those discounts apply. However, for the first week, this is actually free right now, so it'll be free through Friday. Um, kind of that will close down the free period um, for people to try it out to really encourage them and give them a full week. We do have five vehicles in service with two spares. Um, they are very nicely wrapped, as you can kind of see in that image. I have a full picture of the vehicles at a later uh, slide so you can see them. And then our software contractor is Via Mobility. So that's who is in charge of the app um, and the app design. So it's essentially what's called a white label app. And on the operations contract, we went with transit team. And so that is the contract that MTS is overseeing. A little bit about our launch week, which we are right in the middle of. <laughs> so Wednesday ending Friday, uh, we had, like I said, the open streets on Broadway for September 10th. Thank you all for joining. Um, we did have a good crowd. I think Open Streets was very successful also. Um, and thanks to those of you that spoke and that came out. 
Um, we have been doing a free ride promotion uh, from the 10th to the 16th, as I said, and we've actually done a direct mailer. So there's really only about 7,000 households in this service area. Um, every single one got a postcard about this service. Um, and I think that's indicative when you kind of see some of the stats on the next slide about how many downloads we've had. Um, you'll also see kind of over the next two weeks, the marketing campaign will begin. So we've targeted the sea line buses, some of the interior cards, and the sea line pylons. So you'll see a, a campaign in that aspect of it too. Some of the early results, those numbers are a little off, but fairly close. So we've had about 56 ride requests for the first three days. Um, the app downloads are very wrong. We've had about 100 people sign up and create accounts in the micro app each day of service. So we're up to about 400, which is really good considering there's only about 7,000 households. Um, we do have a call-in number in case people don't have access to a smartphone or they don't have a data plan where they can use it. Um, so we have a call-in number. I think we've gotten about two calls um, in there now, so definitely booking through the app has been the most popular. And with that, I'm happy to answer any questions, but those were the preliminary stats. Thank you, Mr. Any questions? Uh, Cummings. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, it was a wonderful event. Thank you for that. It, and it was a beautiful day, and it was just really exciting to see so much enthusiasm and all the partners having an opportunity to speak. I think it's just great. Um, really uh, stress the importance of getting the word out, even to those who maybe don't live in the area, through because people travel in that area are going to be in that area and can use the service as well. My question about the vehicles, uh, are they fully accessible? They look like they are not. They are fully, thank you, <laughs> council member. Um, they are fully accessible. Okay. So they, some of them actually have three spaces for a wheelchair, but operationally we've limited the capacity to two per vehicle. So two wheelchair users per vehicle. Thank you. Council Barber. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, so this is a pilot project. So um, what are, what all data are you collecting and what are we gonna look at and can we change things during, um, during the program, if we learn things, I would like to know how are we going to use this to inform future things. Yes, thank you, Council Member. So, we have a set of performance metrics that we set up before the project was initiated and before we even put out the RFP. Um, so, we are looking at traditional performance measures around transit, so normal um, key performance indicators. So, passengers per in service hour, things that you would look at both with Metro Mobility or on the Metro Transit side, on the fixed route side. However, we don't anticipate that it will perform like fixed route. Micro transit never does. So we've tried to build in as many qualitative measures as we possibly can to see how customers, how satisfied are our customers with the service. Because that's really one of the most important pieces of this. This is a premium level service. Um, you know, it picks you up right where you are, drops you off right where you need to go. Um, so we need a way to incorporate those evaluation metrics too. So we have two survey periods set, um, one at three months and one at six months, which is pretty standard for a microtransit pilot. We'll be able to reevaluate, but we do have kind of our core set of, of key performance indicators. Um, thank you, and thank you for all of this. I think this is a great thing that we're offering. Um, I'm really excited to see how it performs over the long term. I think it's a great asset and just another piece of sort of connecting people to the transit system. So thank you for all your work. Thank you. Councilmember Yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair, and Meredith, congratulations. I mean, this is a huge, a huge deal, right? And it's adding a whole new type of transit into our transit mix. And, uh, and also congratulations on the event. As Councilmember Cummings said, the weather was perfect. Councilmember Chambliss joined us, the chair, the mayor of Minneapolis, other local officials. And if I'm, if I'm not mistaken, both Commissioner Irene Fernando, who was there, and Councilmember Jeremiah Ellison, who was there, live in the pilot area. So I suspect that they'll be using it. And just, I mean, it's obvious to say, but just what benefit this is to the community there, that last mile of transit or getting to and from a grocery store, this point-to-point -point transit is, I think, just an incredible 
uh, offering. And, and I love to hear you say that it's a premium service. And I think it's really important about where this is happening. And it's happening in the communities that have some of the highest transit using households in our system. And so, so I think that's something cool. And, uh, and I was just sitting here thinking while you were presenting, it was probably 15 years ago maybe when I served on TAB representing the city of Minneapolis and Kenya McKnight was a citizen representative on TAB. And we had approached the uh, director of Metro Transit with concerns about the lack of services, amenities, uh, for transit in North Minneapolis and and commitments were made to really focus on North Minneapolis. So when you see this pilot being implemented, you know, we have the C line, the D line, we're working on the blue line and just, you know, just that, that a community that really made its concerns heard and used its voice about getting better transit or increased transit investment and more premium service in their community. And we're really delivering on that. I think we should just take a moment to, to know that we can always improve, but at least we're doing something. So thanks for your work and, and your team. Yeah, thanks, Council Yeah, Member. I follow up on the idea of community trust is when you actually not, don't just say things, but you actually deliver mm -hmm. mm -hmm. services. So this is huge. Council Member Wolf. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm interested in finding out how many, as this goes through, how many riders use that to get to, say, the sea line mm -hmm. for getting elsewhere, especially people who are a little more frail and maybe don't can't walk a long distance to get to a bus line. Um, you know, it opens up more opportunities for disabled customers rather than having to wait for Metro Mobility, being able to use the app to get to the sea line to get to everywhere else. So are you, I, I'm assuming you'll be keeping information like that to yes, share with thank us. thank you, Council Member. I, we definitely think this is going to be a service that, that benefits um, that group of people as well, especially in the winter. Um, so we have stats on all of that, the rides, ride information that we will be able to track who is transferring um, to transit from, from the micro. Thank you. Uh, Councilmember Lee. Yeah, thanks, Mr. Chair. Yeah, I, I think uh, I'd advocate that um, with, after a future evaluation of the pilot, um, if we could bring it to maybe to the east side of St. Paul so that the East Metro folks get <laughs> in on this, the, the action too. I, so I live on uh, White Bear, Minaha on the east side of St. Paul. And if I want to go up two miles to some of the restaurants by the border of Maplewood or Larbenton, White Bear, Sometimes, depending on the schedule and the time, I'd have to take a bus that goes that takes me over to downtown, mm -hmm. and then take a second one that comes back up to by Larpenter, and um, and so the east the east side of St. Paul, uh, there, there's um, and constituents complain to me too that the the kind of the interface between the bus lines and and the other forms of transit that we have is is not very good, and so um, I've had college friends who tell me that's exactly why they choose to live on Lake Street instead. And so if we could somehow uh, bring this to the, the East Metro as soon as we can, that'd be great. Thank you. Thank you. And, and with that comment, it's, it's called a pilot to help learn and then expand. So I, I love that idea. Councilmember Johnson. Thank you. And I'm sorry if I missed this. How long is the pilot lasting? How long is this period of time? Thanks, Councilmember. It is 12 months. We have an optional extension for another 12 months after that if it's successful. Okay, great. And what is the fare once the free ride goes away? Um, bus fare, so $2 okay. to 250 depending okay. on its rush hour. Okay, I'm excited about this for all the reasons you've said. Former resident of North Minneapolis, not in this area, but let me tell you, when we had a one car household, this would have been super great. Mm -hmm. In Plymouth, uh, with uh, the dial ride in Maple Grove too, they've got on-demand service already through their own provider. And I'm telling you, as, as uh, some of us in this corridor are working to eventually bring VRT, we might actually have last mile solved before we get BRT out, which would be super exciting because usually it's the opposite. And it's not coming you know, in, in the near future. I hope I live long enough to see it. But what's really great is seeing some of these pieces that come together that can connect to our services that are already there. But how, if we can keep it there and expand it to other places uh, as we build out our future bus lines, we've solved the problem that we're trying to solve for now. So I applaud you for your work. I would have been there Saturday, but I had to work this weekend, and um, I'm thrilled to, you know, maybe get a glimpse of it one way or another. 
in the near future. Thank you. Great, thank you. Other comments, thoughts? Oh, go ahead, Councilmember Gonzalez. Thank you, and just briefly, well, I was not was not ignoring you while you were giving your presentation. I was actually signing up for the app mm. <laughs> <laughs> because I work on West Met, uh, West uh, Broadway. So um, hopefully, down the road, I will definitely use this to go to our other work sites um, south of West Broadway. So this is great. Thank you very much for the service. I've got it in my phone, so uh, I, I, but, but you have to be in the service area. We're not there now, so I'll just <laughs> point that out. Uh, any, any other thoughts, questions? All right, well, thank you, Meredith. We really appreciate your t actually making some time here to, with us today yes. to uh, help um, explain you, what Chair. it is we're doing, and uh, we'll want to hear how it's going. Thanks. Absolutely. Well, that concludes our information items and our business items. Um, so uh, is there uh, any reports or information that you, anyone would, council members would like to share? Mr. Chair? Yeah. Just briefly, um, about, I think maybe it was a week and a half ago, I got to go out to Cranberry Ridge, which is Beacon Interfaith Housing's newest, I believe, uh, um, neighborhood that came online. And it was a beautiful day. Um, Councilmember Lindstrom came out. Um, we had a bunch of fun with the, the supporters of that um, community and, and the people who live there. It was really rewarding because I think from start to finish, that took over six years perhaps. We recounted during some of our talking points and um, communications with the group how long and how difficult it was just to get it through the local process. But I want to tell everybody here how grateful they were that the Metro HRA uh, worked with Plymouth HRA. Uh, Plymouth put 10 um, housing choice vouchers in and Metro HRA put in 10. And it was really, I think, um, one of those things that was the catalyst to get it over the hump and get it to the next point. I um, met a, a woman there who spoke about her family. She has uh, three children. I think it was ages 15 down to maybe eight, if I'm remembering correctly. She'd been hom homeless three times in this past year. This is the first time her children, her family, will have a place to live. Um, the children in that um, uh, neighborhood, I call it a neighborhood because it's a neighborhood, part of our neighborhood, but it, the apartment building are going to Greenwood Elementary School and Wyzetta Schools. They are thrilled. They have school stability that they probably have never had, um, at least in their recent life, but probably forever. Um, I spoke with a teacher in my neighborhood where I live, and they're thrilled to welcome the children and the families into the school. This is a game changer for folks. And also, this has four, uh, several four-bedroom units, three-bedroom units. It is beautiful. Um, just to the west is a high-end senior living facility that I think you, know, you spend about $5,000 a month to live in with all the good stuff. This building rivals that when it comes to appearance, and uh, they'll be putting in a, um, a park for the children to play. So um, I just was thrilled to be part of it, and um, I know that they've sent out an invite if anybody on the council would like to go visit it. It really puts into perspective, I think, the story of, like we're talking tonight, the difference that it makes in people's lives. Um, people were thrilled, and um, I just wanted to share that with you. So thanks to Metro HRA, HRA for I think it was just over two years ago that came through on those 10 extra vouchers to match Plymouth's and um, and for and thanks to Beacon and all the people that are in congregations and community groups throughout um, it was a great event and um, appreciate everybody's support um, for what we're trying to do throughout the region. Thanks for sharing that and uh, I think the invitation uh, uh, shows some pictures I mean it's pretty impressive yeah what it looks like so it'd be good for folks to be there. Any other thoughts? Oh, go ahead. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, a couple of things. So um, I, yesterday, I just went on a tour, um, a economic development tour of Carver County, where I got to travel on a bus throughout the county. So we went to Cologne, uh, Waconia, Norwood, Young America, um, uh, Chaska, Carver, Victoria, um, throughout, and got to tour with the mayors and with the city staff, but with also with Greater MSP. And it was a very interesting discussions as we were going through, things that are getting mentioned as we're talking about that were 
big impacts in transportation planning, in transit, in the availability and accessibility to some of the great regional parks. You know, a lot of the things that we are very involved with and how important it is for the economic competitiveness of the region. And it was definitely a big part of the messages that was um, that the mayors along the, the corridors out there were giving to greater MSP. So I thought that was really interesting. And then we also had a really exciting thing happen a couple weeks ago. It was the opening um, ribbon cutting of Highway 212. Yeah. Um, so Highway 212, uh, for you've heard me all talk about it, was four lanes, go down to two, back to four, back down to two. The first section of that that needed to be fixed um, is um, going to be opening. And so we had a ribbon cutting out there. And it was a very big celebration because it was very much championed by the locals around there. But it was a challenge to get some of these things done. Um, Councilmember Wolf and I worked very hard with um, some of our transportation planning folks on the truck corridor study. Um, and that is really sort of that study is what triggered that road getting into the transportation policy plan and ultimately getting attention for funding. And so um, it was very exciting. So we actually got lots of thank yous um, out in Carver County. So oh, thank you. Hey, I'm so glad you were there. Uh, mm -hmm. You're speaking near and dear to me in my previous job. And uh, I was there at the groundbreaking, so I'm just glad you were there. <laughs> that been kind of, uh, <laughs> Councilman Pacheco. Mr. Harris, <coughs> we're completing the tour here. I actually went on a tour in New Hope uh -huh. last night. And so uh, the mayor and uh, council members and a lot of the community advisory yeah, community advisory members were there. And it was just taking a trip around New Hope, looking around, looking at the developments and looking at the changes in housing. And it was actually very, it was fun and it was very interesting. Well, the, the mayor is very kind and very outspoken at mm -hmm. that. Blue leg. She's a host. Oh, okay. uh, well, Senator Rest uh, uh, was also there. Yes. And I went to introduce myself and I've known her over the years. She says, you've gained a few points for showing up. That's right. <laughs> right. That's that's more than half the points. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Any other stories to tell? I'm sure we all do. Oh, sorry, Molly. Go ahead. Thank you. Uh, as long as we have a little time, we're telling stories. Um, I did a ride along last week with an officer from the uh, MTPD, and it, it. I just I know that a lot of us were able to attend the different open houses that they offered, which were just wonderful and a lot of work, and I appreciate all of that. The ride along is offered to anybody. It's an excellent way to interact with uh, with our officers and hear what's going on and from their perspective and so on and so forth. And we went all over and did lots of interesting things and uh, wound, out at, uh, wound up out at the um, Mall of America and spoke with the officers who are out there. And it just was a really, really interesting uh, thing and I had done other ride-alongs in the city of Hopkins when I was on the city council and as mayor. And it was interesting to compare and contrast and hear the police officers talk about why it is so different to be an MTPD member and, and many things that I hadn't thought about. Mm -hmm. And uh, so anyway, if you haven't done it or you have done it and you want to do it again, I just would really encourage everyone to do it because it's a, it's a wonderful opportunity and uh, really appreciate the effort that went into um, taking me out and about. How long were you out and about? Well, it was, I was out for five hours. Oh my gosh, mm -hmm. uh -huh. good for you. Um, yeah, we, we had a little extension that maybe had not been planned, mm. so it wound up being a little bit longer, but it, that was fine, it was good, yeah. it was great. That's life. But you can pick, you know, you can say, I have two hours or three hours or whatever, so, and they're happy to, to cater, or if you have a particular interest or you want to go someplace in particular or understand this or that, um, they will make every effort to accommodate that. So, really a good opportunity. I really appreciate you sharing that. Thank you. Mm -hmm. you should. Any other else? All right. <laughs> Wendy, go ahead. As long as we're talking about ride-alongs, I did one too, and I would encourage all of you yeah. to sign up. It means a lot to our police officers that we care mm -hmm. about what they're doing, and they want to show us the good work that they're doing in the community. So if you haven't done it, please do. They will, if you want to go at night, whenever you want to go, they will They will find somebody to take you around and, and uh they, they like asking questions about what, what do we really know about what they do, too, because we don't always hear things until stuff goes way bad. Um, 
it, but having that communication about what we understand about their job and them being able to share their stuff and find them finding out what our perspective is, what do we do as a council member is healthy for the relationship with our police department. So mm -hmm. I, I heartily endorse going on a ride along. And uh, I'll just echo too, the round tables were really interesting mm -hmm. having those direct conversations. Mm -hmm. Appreciate those members who participated in that. Yeah, go ahead, Judy. And to that point, Mr. Chair, I went to one of them. It was super great. Um, in all my years as a council member and mayor, very close with our PD and chief and really appreciated their perspectives. Um, and, and I don't know, we operate differently than a city. We should, we're not a city, but I always enjoyed when we did um, the swearing in of police officers and firefighters. And I mentioned this during our listening session, we would bring them in so that everybody who viewed our meetings publicly could see the swearing in of our officers. Yeah. The badge pinning ceremony is very special because family members come up, it's very touching. And then we would just congratulate each of them, kind of go around and shake hands with them. So, um, because we can't get out to all of those, but if there's a way to more formalize that, I think that's a very important moment when somebody's you know officially joining the force um, to bring them in and, and recognize for us it was, um, our solemn vow that we would have their backs and, and we would meet with them at, at the beginning so that they knew that we um, were there and supporting them. So if it's something that we could consider in the future yeah. just to look into, I think it really also states that um, it's a priority for us. Um, it's not just symbolism, but it's you know welcoming, welcoming them into our family um, like we do all of our great staff here. Um, and I think it's good for our citizens who do watch um, our meetings to see that, you know, they're with us here at the beginning of their career with the council. So just an idea. Yeah, interesting idea. Definitely. Okay, uh, regional administrator, Mary Bogey. Well, thank you, Mr. Chair. I'm just kind of following along on that note, I just want to let people know that we are moving along in the hiring process for the chief of police. I think it might already be out on our website. If not, it should be out there sometime today or tomorrow. Please use your channels. Push it out there, um, help us recruit. Yeah, we are using a recruiter, but we certainly rely on you as well to to help us advertise and, and get really good candidates for this position. Go ahead, yeah. Um, I think I had this conversation with Gonzalez here too, is that you know there's a lot of people recruiting in, in Puerto Rico right now uh, for officers and others, uh, other positions. I mean, they, I think most of it because they have citizenship uh, and they've come through as officers through there. Um, and uh, and so I just let you know that because we were just talking about it. I said, well, maybe, we should, maybe we should take a trip down there and help them out. But <laughs> <laughs> I, I volunteer for that. Yeah. <laughs> I, was just thinking, I was thinking of the council. <laughs> we were thinking one of the really important uh, uh, kind of responsibilities of a chief is going to be a leader to attract and recruit officers. Mm -hmm. Right. And it starts with us and our leadership, <coughs> the chief's leadership to make this a welcoming place to recruit our officers. Sorry to belabor this, but this is a good point too, and I could ask you offline, but I think it's nice too for anybody uh, who's watching from home or wherever they watch our meetings. What is the process for selection? I remember I was a new council member when we went through the last one, and I remember coming to, I think, our finalist interview, mm -hmm. and that was public um, at the library in, in Minneapolis. So can you just lay out generally what the process is kind of from beginning to end, how who and might might be involved in the process and what our what our timeline might be? Yeah, unfortunately, I don't see Marcy Simon is here, and I don't have the the calendar laid out for in front of me. Um, but we do have a process for for screening candidates. Um, the recruiter is helping us with with that process, and then bringing them in and you know narrowing down to to final candidates. Um, we do have a steering team um, here at the council that has Wes on it, myself on it. Um, I can't even remember the other other members on it. So, um, so we do have some process laid out. I will certainly get that out to all the council members. Great, I really appreciate that. And I know too, just from past experiences, both public and private. Um, I don't know if the council does this, but we oftentimes will bring in other experts from our counterparts and partners out there that might want to also be part of the interview process to just have a partner perspective. I don't know if we, you know, got to follow all the rules. But it was interesting when we were hiring, for example, a city manager. We might have somebody from another city sit in on it just to have a perspective of another community we work closely with. So um, I'm, I'm excited to see how many applicants we get and where we end up. 
And one thing uh, in this process has been this, uh, the recruiter isn't just to recruit, but it's to help define and, and gather feedback from a number of stakeholders internally and externally about what is it we're really looking for. Mm -hmm. and, and I think I thank those who have been part of that, those conversations. And that uh, position description, the profile, is now, I think, uh, established. So we, we can sure you get to see what, what that is. Yeah, go ahead, John. Yeah, what I was referring to was mostly the, the off, just officers. The chief in, in particular, though, was yeah. uh, I did have questions regarding um, the, is there a requirement that we would go outside and is the existing chief, uh, interim chief, uh, being considered as well? So, Mr. Chair and Council Member, assuming that he applies, absolutely he would be considered. Any other uh, thoughts? Oh. It was a zero report. Anything else? <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Chair, I'm sure. General Counsel. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair. I wanted to echo your thoughts from earlier about Liz. Oh, I mean, I think um, people don't realize like how challenging it was to go from in-person meetings to remote meetings. We didn't know how that was going to work or how long it was going to work. as a lot of work for the recording secretaries and Liz did a fantastic job helping us navigate through all that and doing, I was trying to calculate how many roll calls she did. Um, it was in the hundreds, I think. I, I don't have an exact number, but um, I am gonna miss you and I really appreciate the hard work and I just wanted to put that on the record, so. Thank you. It was a pleasure working with everybody too. And I'll still be around though. <laughs> Good luck in your position. Thank you. Well, Liz, you had the last word. <laughs> <laughs> Congratulations, and thank you, everybody. This meeting is adjourned. Thank you.